Hello, everyone. I'm Leonel August Rodriguez, the VP of Business Development for Access Medical Labs. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on another Access Live, where we bring you insight from leading medical experts. We do ask that all questions are submitted via the Q&A, as it will be answered at the end of our lecture. So today, we have a very special individual who is traditionally trained in family medicine with certification in age management medicine and hormone optimization. What I love most about this individual is that she truly focuses on the wholeness of a person from the physical, the mental, the emotional, spiritual, and sexual. She is an author, she is a teacher, and today we have the pleasure of enjoying a lecture on the over and misdiagnoses of anxiety, depression, mood order, and true underlying cause being hormone imbalance and or trauma. Without further ado, Dr. Jill Stalker. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here or for tuning into the replay. It is truly an honor um, to be speaking here. And this is an invitation to explore a new path, perhaps in your own practice or even in expanding your vision for your practice. Uh, I love that uh, you mentioned being a teacher. It made me think about, um, you know, the teachings in, in medical school uh, while they are long gone. The one thing that has stuck with me was one of my professors saying, listen to your patient. They will tell you what's wrong with them. The only thing about that statement I would correct is, is a lot of times there's nothing wrong with them. It's just we need to tune in a little bit more to the messages and the symptoms and, and be better listeners for them. Uh, I also am a true student um, that has learned from my own patients, and that's how I have expanded my vision and changed my path. Um, as Lionel mentioned, I am board certified in family medicine, and I had a private practice for about 15 years, and I had patients that uh, I hadn't seen for a while that came to me, and they looked great, they felt great, they lost a bunch of weight, and I said, well, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're seeing this hormone doctor, and I said, well, what is this stuff? Because they don't teach this in medical school, so I went and I did, um, I did additional training, and it just woke me up to my entire life, and, and I wanted to be able to share um, share that with my my patients. And once I started adding that to my practice, it truly was um, life changing. It was so much more enjoyable to help wake other people up to their lives, um, my patients. And and um, so I made the transition from family medicine to um, the age management hormone optimization. As a as an entrepreneur, I'm in private practice, and I through the years have also explored and expanded into psychedelic medicine, in particular uh, TAP or ketamine assisted psychotherapy and uh, have further done training to be trauma informed with Dr. Gabor Mate. So I'm bringing all of those experiences, my personal experiences, my professional experiences and life experiences here. And um, I think it's so important that everyone's listening as not just, you know, the provider to take this back to your patient. Of course, I want that. I want to be able to help change the paradigm of medicine. Um, but I want you to listen to it for you too, because you deserve to feel amazing. And you are a person at the, at the, at the base of it. We are all one common humanity. So I think it's so important that healers actually care for themselves too. And they become the teacher by, um, by example, by leading the, the life that they're, they're teaching others about. So um, my start in family medicine uh, was right around when Women's Health Initiative came out. And so I distinctly remember having to take all of my women patients off of their hormones and put them on antidepressants was the only option that we had at the time to manage symptoms. And that's been 20 plus years now. Um, so that was, you know, the first experience with hormone and, and the fear-based and misinformation that was then exposed about that. Um, but my personal experience um, 
growing up, uh, watching my mom go through what they called the change back then where people weren't really talking about it. Uh, there was a lot of shame around it or there was uh, people just kind of getting through it like a, a badge of honor that they would get. And uh, my mom was was mistreated and put on antidepressants and actually became suicidal. Um, she's fortunately still with us. And, and that did not, um, you know, that did not, was not her path. Um, but these are a couple of things that throughout my career have really uh, made an imprint on me and um, made it my mission to help spread more information about this so that um, people aren't misdiagnosed or overdiagnosed, that they're heard more um, and that they get the, the treatment, um, the most important treatment being the listening to um, and, and the care that they deserve. And um, we as, as providers, again, need to set the example. And um, so I'm going to go through a little bit of history here. Um, so the current DSM-5 for depression includes these symptoms and they have to be two weeks with at least one of the symptoms being depressed mood or loss of interest and pleasure. And um, if you look at a lot of these symptoms, you know, I invite you to think of yourself, how often have you felt these things? Um, the burnout rate in physicians is real, especially post COVID. And again, I, I'm talking to you as a provider who's going to hopefully, um, you know, have a, a wider view of, of when they go in to see their next patient and listen to them, but also you as the person, uh, because it's so important that we do speak up. Um, we are, um, we are humans too. We go through these things as well um, as physicians. So, um, I just am curious, you know, with the fatigue and, and brain fog and all of those, um, you know, it's, it's fairly common. So um, we need to open our eyes as far as being quick to, to diagnose or actually wait to listen. So one out of every five women is affected by depression as they progress through menopause. And the diagnosis of, of menopause is you know, not having a period for, for a year. Um, but perimenopause and hormone changes start as early as our twenties and thirties. And there are so many other symptoms that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later that, um, depression is just one of those symptoms. Uh, the lifetime prevalence of mood disorders in women is approximately twice that of men, but not to leave the men out almost 31% of men have suffered from a period of depression in their lifetime, 9% having, um, uh, having daily feelings of depression or anxiety, and 50% of women and 60% of men will experience at least one trauma in their lives. That's according to the National Center for PTSD. As I mentioned, it's so important as providers to, as healers, to take care of ourselves. One doctor per day commits suicide in the U.S., the highest suicide rate of any profession, and more than twice that of the general population. For Medscape's 2019 report on physician burnout, 44% of physicians were burned out. In 2017, the World Health Organization listed depression as the leading cause of ill health and disability worldwide. These numbers are, are pretty significant. The bottom line is that both men and women and practitioners, everyone here listening, um, suffer from de depressed mood, anxiety, and other mood changes, but the way we approach it varies widely and needs significant reevaluation. Re the question is, can we as pr practitioners listen to these symptoms as messengers with more curiosity and compassion rather than be so quick to label them with an in-the-box diagnosis like depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder? And again, should we be listening to diagnose or listening to learn? 
How we communicate and listen to our patients and ourselves is crucial to changing this paradigm. Uh, many physicians and practitioners, they just power through, they don't take time off, they don't take um, wellness days, self-care is not there. And so to really take a deeper look at ourselves as practitioners is equally necessary. Uh, the average physician interrupts their patient at 11 seconds. And I used to be that physician because I was governed by, um, you know, my schedule and um, insurance. And so we need to break that. Um, the traditional medical teachings, as I've mentioned, are around the fix it band-aid medicine. You know, we just want to put band-aids everywhere. But if we truly listened to our patients, they would tell us and we'd be able to be more curious about what the underlying condition is. But people are scared. I noticed when I transitioned to hormone optimization and shared with my first patient about my experience of you know, being on hormones, I saw her eyes light up and she was like, oh my gosh, I felt like I was so alone. And that was when I realized it was really imperative that I share my common humanity as well. And in training, we're taught to have this, you know, imaginary barrier and um, we need to be able to talk more openly and freely so that people can not be scared of us, um, not be scared to talk about like the most intimate parts of their lives. So this then becomes, would you rather be treated as a number or a person? Because as we know, in medical school and further trainings, we're taught to look at the number and diagnose um, and treat the number. But a lot of times those reference ranges or the normal ranges are simply a bell curve of the average overweight, unhealthy American, white American, um, doesn't take into consideration any other race. Um, and it's just what fits under that bell curve. Doesn't mean that person feels good, functions good, free of age-related diseases. So listening to your patient is super important and listening to your own self. And how often have you said, I'm fine to yourself, to your patients, to your spouse, to your friends, when really you're burnt out, you're having a lot of these symptoms, you're tired, you have brain fog, you're not sleeping well. And it's our duty as healers to dig deeper into ourselves, explore this for ourselves, um, but also are listening to our patients rather than to perpetuate this quick fix, just fix the symptom. We really want to get to the root of the problem. And again, I'm just going to drive this home one more time. We deserve as practitioners and healers to thrive and not just survive and get off of that hamster wheel of life. So a bit of history, menopause was once regarded as a sign of sin, decay, and later neuroses. Hence, it was medicated with antidepressants, anti-anxiety uh, medications. And then it was later redefined by physicians in the 1960s as a deficiency D disease. So there's always been a ton of, of shame and stigma around even talking about it because of the way it was first labeled. I find for myself talking with patients, I do the majority of the talking to gain their trust and to say, are you having fatigue, brain fog, difficulty sleeping, dry vagina, um, loss of self-confidence, easy irritability, these things. And they came in for one thing because they didn't know that all the other things were actually something that could be helped. They just had taken that into you know, this is just part of my life. This is, I've been told by so many doctors that my labs are normal and, you know, just to exercise more and, and eat cleaner and that there was nothing to be done for it. So, um, when I, when I take the lead and say, you know, all those things, it brings it out because they're not going to say it to us outright. Um, and it may take up more time. Um, if you're still in traditional insurance based, you know, time sensitive visits, um, you could possibly do a, um, a little survey um, where you ask those questions and that way it helps them to open up a little bit, saves you a little bit of time until you make the transition into your own practice. Um, for years, depression 
was treated as though it was a serotonin deficiency, only to find out just two years ago that there's no correlation. So we've been perpetuating this this big pharma, um, you know, correlation that wasn't even there, and we've been medicating people for years based on this assumption. So old paradigm is treat the number. The new paradigm is treat the person. Be you centered care, patient centered care. Again, being traditionally trained, I used to go in with my list of things that I need to get, um, past medical history, past surgical history. And yes, those are all important, but it's also important to know who your patient is. What do they do? What's their life like? Um, what are their goals? And it's not just healthcare, but personal, professional. That all affects who that person is coming to you, sitting across from you. So get to know them and, and say, you know, tell me your story. They will open up and you will get all that information, but in a much more comfortable setting um, where they will finally tell you what is bothering them. So again, listening to learn, not to medicate. So some people don't even know, they don't know what they don't know. So a lot of times people will come to me and they say, I just feel off or I feel like a shell of myself. I don't feel like myself. I feel dead or blah inside. Or again, I've seen a million practitioners told them you know, various things and they just keep telling me everything's fine. So this is where advocating, I help others advocate for more because they deserve more. You deserve more. And the four most powerful words a patient can hear is you're not alone. Now, if you're not comfortable disclosing anything personal, I understand it's a process, but you know, just knowing that they're not alone, that you're there to listen to them, um, not to fix anything that's broken, but they, they have to feel that safety to be able to um, open up about what's really bothering them. So my most profound patient evolution, um, to give you an example, of something that you may come across in your practice. A 21 year old female with severe PMS, mostly irritability and heavy cramps while in postgraduate school. Um, she went to a provider which issued the standard care of birth control and Seraphim, which was generic Prozac. Seraphim worked until it didn't. She had a flat affect, irritability. Her meds were changed to Wellbutrin, Cymbalta to name a few. Her mood stabilized, but it was still flat inside. At 38 years of age, she started losing her hair, was tired, but was she, was she was raising three small kids and working full time, thought it was just part of life. Providers tell her that her labs are nor normal and that there's nothing to do, with it, to do about it. She sees someone who listens to her story, not her number, and treats her with thyroid. Other hormones are optimized. She wakes up to her life. She feels the brain fog lift. She has more vitality. She trans transitions out of an abusive relationship and to a completely new career in which she's thriving. She was medicated for almost 20 years for what was never the problem, only to have her hormones optimized, trauma acknowledged and proper avenues explored. And now she's living a life beyond her wildest dreams. She is me. This is why it is so important for me to spread this message so that you don't do this to people. I did that to people because I didn't know better. I was medicating people. I didn't know how to listen. I interrupted in 11 seconds. This completely changed my life. And now it is my mission to help others change theirs, and also help to change the medical paradigm. We need to remember as practitioners, we are all one humanity. In sharing our stories with others, it gives them permission to share theirs, and in a sense, unlocks them from their own prison. More studies. Um, this shows that premenopausal women with no lifetime history of major depression who enter perimenopause were twice as likely to develop significant depressive symptoms as women who remained premenopausal. 
the North American Menopause Society showed that 23% of women go through mood swings before, during, and after menopause, and they describe it as anxiety, irritability, and depressed mood. In the Journal of Psychiatry and Neuroscience, um, they showed that irritability is the primary mood complaint for up to 70% of women during perimenopause and created an irritability scale. They also showed in a separate study um, of these called anger attacks that perimenopausal women would have. Um, the point is that we are diagnosing people with depression where we think it's, you know, they're crying all the time. They don't feel themselves, you know, and the only term we really know is depression. And this anger, this irritability, those are all signs of hormone imbalance, not to be put in a box and labeled as depression. So the effects of estrogen on mood and cognition in aging women showed improved mood, less anxiety, um, they also showed that they, the quality of life um, showed a significant improvement in anxiety and depressive symptoms when using micronized progesterone. Again, these are all studies, you know, well-being, overall sense of well-being and quality of life. Those are things that are super important. And there are studies, but we don't have that as a necessary barometer for um, being able to diagnose something. Yet it's so important that you have an overall um, high quality of well being and quality of life. So, low T affects both men and women, um, not, and it doesn't present just as low libido or difficulty with orgasm and, and desire. Um, but it's also, you know, a nonspecific symptom of depression, hormone imbalance, and trauma. And it's easier to label as depressed and suppress drive even further with antidepressants or treat both symptom and cause by addressing the testosterone um, in both men and women. Um, and there's various ways to do that. I'm happy to, to expand on that if people are looking into this field. Um, there's also a um, precursors to uh, testosterone, DHEA, there's vaginal DHEA for women um, who are afraid of being on testosterone, that they're going to get too big or turn into a man. Um, and the vaginal DHEA is actually something that you can use in women who have had breast cancer. And um, there is no systemic absorption um, of, of the hormones. So they're able to take it. And the vaginal DHEA is not just for dry vagina, but it helps with the libido, the sensitivity, and the inner vitality that we all deserve. So there are options. Um, so JAMA Psychiatry showed the association of testosterone treatment with alleviation of depressive symptoms in men. Um, this was the largest study that they've had and uh, the score reduction of 50% are greater with the higher dosage reg regimens. DHEA, as I mentioned before, is a building block for testosterone, but uh, if used by itself, has an effect on depression. It increases your lean muscle mass and also has anti-aging effects. Uh, the journal Family Practice showed the benefits of estrogen, including prevention of depression, and then the um, testosterone deficiency, depression, and loss of vitality amongst other. So all of these studies are confirming, and it's a matter of looking at everything, putting it together, and truly listening to your, to your patient. Thyroid and mood is huge. The thyroid um, T3 is what crosses the blood-brain barrier. And so a lot of people get in traditional me medicine, get put on Synthroid or Levothyroxine, which is T4. And if your body doesn't convert to T3, then it's, it's um, pretty much useless. So using things like either straight T3 or armor thyroid, which has the T3 and the T4, crosses the blood-brain barrier to give you that mental clarity um, and also the mood. So um, this, is, this is a big one. Um, 
where not just going based on somebody's number, but listening, are they tired? Do they have brain fog? Do they, have they gained weight or haven't been able to lose weight? Um, are they feeling depressed? Um, do they feel cold a lot? Um, are they losing their hair? Those are all thyroid symptoms. Um, so this one, there was actually a study, this is my favorite study, uh, showed that with thyroid, and this was not based on a, a blood test, these were all patients who were treated based on symptoms, that the average patient, patient had been on 14 medicines for mood, and the moment their thyroid was optimized, 84% of them improved and 33% had full remission. And that was not based on a lab test. So again, you know, looking at your number versus looking at who's sitting, listening to who's sitting across from you is so, so vital. Um, another interesting statistic is when your thyroid receptors, which when we're measuring thyroid levels, we're measuring serum blood levels. We're not looking at if it crosses the blood brain barrier or if the thyroid receptors are taking it up, but the thyroid receptors become 50% less responsive when you are in burnout or adrenal fatigue, or you have cortisol fluctuations. So this is why we noticed, you know, when people went through um, the COVID situation, um, that's a huge stress on the body. And eventually your body gets burned out and it's, it's done. The cortisol goes up, we gain belly fat, and then, and then it drops and we come, become tired upon tired. We can't lose the weight. And again, your thyroid receptors have become 50% less responsive um, as a result. But your number on the lab test is going to show normal, but your patient is not going to feel themselves. They're going to have all those symptoms I mentioned. Um, this one showed with bipolar disorder specifically um, that 69% of patients with bipolar disorder are misdiagnosed initially and more than a third remain misdiagnosed for 10 years or more. These studies show, this one is so significant. Um, most people with bipolar are treated for only depressive symptoms. So that, that's why the misdiagnosis, they get treated for depression and then their mania um, acts out and then they finally get the, the treatment that they deserve um, and that they need. Uh, because only 9% of bipolar patients, bipolar 2 patients, were accurate, accurately diagnosed. And one study concluded that when a woman is diagnosed with bipolar at 25, I believe, um, she ultimately may lose up to 14 years of effective functioning. So again, all of these things, they start in our 20s and 30s. This is, is not just for people going through menopause. But, um so the other things that are, are used, that I used in my practice um, is the mood disorder questionnaire um, for bipolar disorder and then the Zung um, scale for depression. Um, there's a couple other um, scales that you can use as well. But for the mood disorder questionnaire, these are things that if positive could result in diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So irritability, remember I mentioned about the irritability scale for perimenopause for hormone imbalance. Um, Self-confidence issues, sleep issues, easy distractibility or brain fog, difficulty concentrating, um, and then uh, alters altered uh, sex drive. These are all the same signs and symptoms of hormone imbalance and or trauma. So for this, a diagnosis requires only four days of any of these symptoms. I wonder if you think about like, wow, I've you know, I've gone four days without sleeping well and a little bit of brain fog and not really feeling sexual. Well, if you go to the wrong person, you're going to get put on a medicine for bipolar disorder. So again, these are the things I was talking about. The other one that um, I learned through my trauma training is the ACEs, um, which I'm going to, uh, is on the next slide, I believe. And that's adverse childhood events. Um, I will, I definitely um, give this to people who I'm um, considering psychedelic medicine with, uh, but I get a lot of this information just from talking with them in their, uh, in their intake, because it's so important for me looking at the entire person. Um, and these are 
big T traumas that they're talking about. They're not necessarily like the little T traumas. And so this is not an all-inclusive list um, as far as like the trauma symptom checklist, um, the overlapping symptoms present in all, again, um, including, including the menopause inventory, fatigue, mood swings, difficulty concentrating. Those are all the same symptoms in each of those categories, trauma, hormone imbalance, depression, um, bipolar disorder. So it's so important to be able to discern. Um, so this is the ACEs score and, um, I'm happy to send this to anybody who wants to um, look at this a little in detail. Your total ACE score is the is the total number of checked responses. Now, the link between ACEs and depression, the higher the number of your ACE score, so it is important for you to do it yourself to see where you're at. Um, the higher the rate of both lifetime and recent depressive episodes. And exposure to ACEs is associated with increased risk of, of depressive disorders up to decades after their occurrence. So we're talking childhood trauma can present in your 30s, 40s, 50s. It was just suppressed for so long. So this is so important. Um, to, to ask those questions, or if, if you're not quite comfortable asking directly, at least get them um, this, this score and you can kind of have a, an idea and be able to refer them out if you don't feel comfortable talking to them about it. Now, the resources that I recommend to become trauma-informed, there's so many out there, but these are the ones that were just life-changing for me. Um, and what I did personally uh, is The Body Keeps the Score, this really talks about like the mind, body, trauma, body, um, disease connection and how it presents differently. Uh, it's a heavy read, but it's, I, it's so life-changing and profound. Uh, the teachers and books of Dr. Gabor Mate, he is a traditionally trained family practitioner as well that transitioned out and only does trauma-informed medicine and developed his own technique called compassionate inquiry, um, which I trained with him directly learning that. Uh, because it's so important with psychedelic medicine to um, have follow-up, the integration afterwards, because you are going to be uncovering trauma that if they have nowhere to go, um, there's a missed opportunity for healing there. Um, the other book that I would recommend um, is, I didn't put it on there, is When the Body Says No um, by Dr. Gabor Mate. Um, and again, that explores the stress disease connection as well. Um, and then IFS, Internal Family Systems Teachings uh, by Dr. Dick Schwartz. And actually he and Gabor Mate have collaborated where they have a group training now. Um, and, but there are a lot of free resources if you look at YouTube as well. So people say that what we're all seeking is a meaning for life. I don't think that that's what we're really seeking. I think that what we're seeking is an experience of being alive so that our life experiences on the purely physical plane will have resonances with our own innermost being and reality so that we actually can feel the rapture of being alive. It is our duty as healers, not only to lead by example, be teachers, wanting more for ourselves, but also for our patients and generations to come. Everyone deserves to live a full, vibrant life, and we as healers have the power to give that amazing gift of feeling the rapture of being alive. And this is a bit more about me and my offerings. Um, and um, I'm happy to answer additional questions uh, if you feel like uh, emailing me afterwards. I do hold licenses in the various states. So I do, um, my primary practice is based out of Los Angeles. Um, and I hope this reached at least one person. And I thank you for this opportunity. Dr. Joe, uh, what an amazing lecture on, you know, hormone optimization, trauma, and and thank you for sharing your personal story with us. Uh, you've already answered the first question in the Q&A, which is, how do I get in touch with you? So thank you, you know, for allowing, uh, you know, access to you, um, to our viewers. 
Now, the second question we have is you discussed depression in providers earlier on in your lecture. How did you mentally find the balance to take care of yourself and your patients? Well, uh, I think we as providers were taught early on from our training, which is a trauma in itself. Anybody, any physicians in here, that is a shared trauma of going through medical school, internship and residency and being exposed to death and dying, violence, and not really having the tools to cope with it. You just are taught to put the wall up and keep going. And so there was a lot of suppression. And, you know, most people, trauma survivors are the best, like first responders, because we know how to put that wall up. And we're taught in medical school to put the wall up, don't share anything personal. And so that's, I mean, I always functioned, I, that that's, there was no other, other option. Um, but I also um, didn't feel I felt dead inside at one point. Um, a, a turning point for me was um, coming home after seeing 40 patients a day and laying on the ground in my family room uh, with my three small children running around. I'm staring at the ceiling and I was just thinking, is this it? Like, there's got to be more. And I love my kids. You know, I loved them then, but I just, and I was, I was going through the motions of my life, but I wasn't truly living. And that's what I want for other people to truly live. So if this is you and you're just like, you know, going through what you thought you wanted to do um, when you were, you know, when I was, when I graduated from medical school, I was 25, my brain wasn't even fully developed. Um, so I think a lot of people think um, that once you decide that there's no changing, that you can't change careers. And that's another thing that I want to help empower people you can pivot. I've pivoted a couple of times and expand your vision because once I found this, I was lit up. It was like, this is what I want to do. I truly, I truly think that that experience I went through is, you know, was given to me to work through, to be able to share with others so that they don't have to go through that. And that's why I help others advocate. I also didn't know how to advocate for myself because I grew up, you know, you just listen to the doctor. I didn't know how to ask for more or to want more out of life. Very, very well said. And you know what? I feel like you, you actually, you touched someone tonight. This wasn't more so a question, more of a statement. Uh, one of the listeners, one of the, one of the providers just wanted to thank you um for they are in a rural state is what it seems like based upon their comment and they stated that they feel a sense of community tonight listening to you so mm. that thank you for that 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 is so important it's so important uh the community and i didn't share out loud um because of fear you know of of shame of like well i'm this doctor i'm supposed to have all my stuff together. I don't want to be, you know, labeled as incompetent or anything. And, and the other thing is, you know, as, as practitioners, if we go to get help, um, if we go to a therapist and everything, there's this whole thing of like, well, don't put it on, you know, insurance because you might get labeled as that. That's terrible that we can't even get the care. And, um, it wasn't until a colleague of mine was sharing publicly, um, on a Facebook interview, and she's a doctor about her struggle with depression. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'd never heard somebody share about it. And it just truly changed my life. And that's what I hope for others because there shouldn't be shame. We are, we're people at the base of it. And um, so good. I'm glad, I'm glad that it touched one person and, and having, you know, someone to talk to um, connection and community is a basic human need that we, that we need. And, you know, I also grew up in a family system where we didn't talk about things. We just, just make it look pretty, go do the thing. And, and that's also, you know, as a society, we put on the I'm fine mask. And I think there needs to be more openness. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Um, to, to shift uh, onto another question, um, how do you shift the mindset of a patient who has been diagnosed with depression to understanding that their situation may truly be a hormone imbalance. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I, um, you know, most people, they don't really, they just want to feel better. So if there's hope and they want hope, um, and connection, and I think that's, they need to feel safe with you, um, to even be able to introduce uh, something different because, you know, this was something I, I was practicing the traditional, um, you know, and, and diagnosing and treating people with depression. And then some of those patients became my hormone patients. Huh. And I did get asked the question, well, why didn't we do this last year? Well, I didn't know about it last year. So, <laughs> but there huh. was trust there. I was willing to say like, I didn't know about this stuff. And I went and learned about it and, you know, it changed my life. And I want to share that with others. I think being honest and humble with your patients is the best thing because it's, it's a relationship and it's about um, trust and, and feeling safe. And they don't expect you to know everything. They just want to know that they want to be heard. They want to be witnessed and acknowledged that by far is the biggest healing thing that you can do is to offer your presence, you know, and um, I, I've just offered my presence for people um, and they had profound changes and I didn't even give them anything. Look at that. We hadn't even started the regimen. So I think it, don't underestimate the power of your presence. So just listen, and maybe you're going to start, you know, looking into these other things, but just the power of, of your presence is very healing. Excellent. Um, and our, our last question um, is earlier, you discussed uh, lab ranges and values. So the question is, how do you determine, you know, what optimal reference range in comparison to what's a normal reference range based upon the bell curve? So that's the advanced training in hormone okay. optimization. So there are several different, um, you know, training programs out there. I'm happy to talk with people one-on-one. -on -one. I do offer mentorship and, and teaching in that regard. I've taught other providers um, hormone optimization so that they can um, introduce it into their practice. And then I also, um, you know, help them transition into, you know, their own different model of a practice if they want to do that, because I had to do the whole, you know, get out of, of um, insurance and, and develop a whole new system. And so, um, so I do offer that. Um, and then I can also advise on um, training programs that offer CME and, and all of that as well. Excellent. Well, uh, Dr. Jill, uh, that was it for the questions. Uh, on behalf of Access Medical Labs, we truly want to extend our gratitude again uh, to you for joining us on Access Live. Um, to our audience, you know, thank you for tuning in to another Access Live, where we bring you insight from leading medical experts. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, and stay healthy. Thank you all. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.